Friday. It is indeed. Now, I under, you're from New York. Uh, last night, the Big Al Smith dinner, but you're in Wisconsin, is my understanding, on the ground today, out and about to meet and greet with people and tell them why we need to get out and vote. Yes, I am in Wisconsin working hard as a surrogate for the Trump campaign, and we are working every day to earn this vote. And I think, I know President Trump is so grateful for the outpouring of support from hardworking families all across this state, but every vote is going to matter. This is a key battleground state, and today I'll be talking about education issues, the inflation crisis stemming from Kamala Harris's failed leadership, the border crisis when Kamala Harris was Joe Biden's open borders are, a lot of these issues are front of mind for voters across this country, including in Wisconsin. But excited to be here today on the ground. I'm in Jackson, Wisconsin, about to tour a school, Kevin Moraine Lutheran High School, which is nice. an amazing, high-performing school. And looking forward to talking about President Trump's commitment to educational excellence and school choice. Now, I was going to say, I know, obviously, under his first four years with us, uh, they, they, there was a lot of efforts made to grow the voucher program against school choice, the ability for people's taxpayer dollars to follow the parents' decisions. Uh, you couple that with, you know, kind of the awakening that came from COVID, uh, where parents are suddenly going, my goodness, what are they put, what are they trying to put into the brains of our children with this kind of woke form of education? Is that something we can see a greater focus on in President Trump's next term to really expand that as best one can? Because obviously states have the rights over the, over the vouchers, but to, in, to kind of uh, incentivize that across the board, because ultimately everyone wins under that. The students win, the parents win, taxpayer dollars are better spent. Absolutely, and that's something that President Trump is committed to. And we are already working as House Republicans to prepare federal legislation. A bill that I'm a leader on is the Educational Choice for Children Act, which we just passed through committee this year. And this basically incentivizes charitable donations for individuals and businesses to fund scholarship awards for students that would cover expenses related to K-12 public and private education. So it provides an incentive to be pro-parents, pro-students, and pro-school choice. And the reality is this is no longer just a Republican issue. If you take aside the elected officials, elected Democrats have opposed school choice at every turn, but registered Democrats, just voters across this country, they overwhelmingly, over 77% of registered Democrats support school choice. It's over 80% of Republicans and nearly 70% of independents support school choice. So this is an overwhelmingly bipartisan issue and it's one that resonates because parents want the best possible education for their kids. And you know, my experience, I'm on the Education Committee in Congress. I'm proud to be the first member of Congress who endorsed President Trump. When I was a I was the youngest woman ever at the time, and my parents worked hard to give me educational opportunities. My life, had I not had that amazing education, I think would have been very different. I wouldn't have had these opportunities to serve at the highest level in Congress. But we want to make sure every family has that educational opportunity for their kids. Now, let me ask you, because I mean, you may not probably don't know, I'm actually... I'm a I'm an expatriate in the sense I was born and raised in Washington D.C. That's where I actually uh, did my you know my K through 12 education and uh, first through 12th grade in private school. So I appreciate that and I appreciate the the quality of the education. That's why I've been such a proponent of vouchers. But you talked about a moment ago in terms of the numbers when it comes to just everyday Americans. There's a great deal of support for school choice, but as you said, unfortunately, there's a divide. Behind the veil, though, when you're up there on Capitol Hill, not on the floor debating these things and everything else, but, you know, in the in the lunchrooms or whatever it might be within, you know, within the, the House office buildings, what, I mean, do you ever get a sense from uh, your, the, the Democratic members of the House that they'd like to support it, but they're, they're kind of publicly against it because they have to be, because it just doesn't make sense to me. When you look at voucher programs, on average, they spend half as much for a better quality education, it, it's kind of a no-brainer why this this works. Well, you know, the Democrat Party today has become so radical. So even if they look at the facts, even if they look at the vast majority of voter support, school choice, Democrats are unwilling and have failed to show leadership on this issue. And in fact, they've opposed it at every opportunity, including Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris has opposed educational opportunity for kids. And we saw during COVID, we saw when so many schools were forced to go to remote learning, parents for the first time got to see how politicized 
schools have become under failed Democrat leadership. And that's why you're seeing this resurgence of parents really rolling up their sleeves, getting involved, running for school board. And it's frankly why the Republicans passed the Parents' Bill of Rights, which ensures five simple things that are so straightforward. Number one, parents have a right to know what's being taught in schools and to see the reading material. Number two, parents have a right to be heard. Parents have a right to see the school budget and spending. Parents have a right to protect their child's privacy. And the parents have a right to be updated on any violent activity at school. Almost every Democrat opposed that. Think about that, that those primary roles of parents, Democrats oppose those very basic rights, which is why President Trump has been so supportive of the Parents' Bill of Rights. And again, Kamala Harris opposes these basic, basic rights for parents. And, and again, it's astounding because what, they, in one breath, they say how they, they're, you know, she keeps saying, I'm from a middle class family, which I, even the way she says it is awkward, right? Which is, you know, you ask her a question, she goes, well, you know, I, I'm from a middle class family. It's not even an answer. It, it just comes across flat. Uh, but nothing they support, nothing that they're pushing, even her appearance last night, or, well, pseudo appearance, it was a video, uh, even that, it just, it, it always seems forced insincere versus we saw Donald Trump who delivered I thought did a great job uh, delivering some great jokes but still being on point of the importance of this election uh, uh, you know I know again you're you're in the state of New York normally uh, here in Wisconsin we go we vacillate red blue red blue I'm hopeful we'll be able to to pull it off for the president but even in New York we're hearing rumblings of of seeing at least larger than normal support if not the possibility of seeing an upset in New York uh, and I, I think, again, it speaks to the fact that his is a message that resonates with Americans first, and then party comes second to that. You are spot on, and New York has been a really interesting state to watch. If you look at the congressional midterms, it was New York that flipped those five congressional seats that delivered the House Republican majority, which frankly is our last line of defense uh, over the past two years from single party failed Democrat rule under Kamala Harris and Joe Biden. And President Trump knocked it out of the park last night at the Al Smith dinner. I want to encourage your listeners to go watch some of the clips. The jokes are hilarious. They are hysterical and spot on. It was the right tone, a perfect delivery. Everybody had a great time. Compare that with the contrast. First of all, Kamala Harris was the first presidential candidate not even to show up. She sent a video, and it was a tone-deaf video. I have many friends in that room, and they told me it came over awful. And versus President Trump, just hit it out of the park. I'm very excited President Trump is doing an event in Madison Square Garden because you're right. He understands that he's committed to being a president for all Americans, and his poll numbers go up and up. But, boy, in Wisconsin, we are going to count on a big, big turnout for President Trump in Wisconsin. It is a state that is you can't get higher to the top of the list of importance and every vote is going to matter so making sure people to turn out in wisconsin is so so critical the economy wisconsin just like other states across the country families are suffering under inflation they're suffering under uh, a wide open border they're they're looking around the world and looking at the catastrophic foreign policy under kamala harris and joe biden compared to the peace through strength and really peace around the world we had under president Trump. So these are stark contrasts. And uh, I think, you know, as, as undecided voters make their decision, look at President Trump's record of success over four years versus this abysmal failure. And Kamala Harris keeps talking about day one. Day one was four years ago for this administration. They have failed and it's gotten worse over the past four years. Well, and, and on that front, I mean, we just talked earlier in the show about this. And by the way, we've been playing some of the jokes because I agree they they were absolutely hysterical. Uh, but but we heard news this morning. Uh, I don't know that it's fully confirmed, but that North Korea is sending troops to Russia to fight alongside Russian troops in in this ever expanding Ukrainian war uh, that didn't happen under Trump, right? It ha I mean, they they as he said many times, if I were still in, in the White House, this would not have happened i mean we've talked about it we've heard the rumblings that world war three could be on the horizon under the inept in in weak leadership of harris and biden but assuming that this is correct that you see troops coming from north korea now that that is a scary prospect as we sit 18 days away from this election one that should be sobering for anyone republican democrat independent under donald trump no new wars under under harris and biden 
we have two wars raging, one in the Middle East, this one in Ukraine, and none of them are, you know, particularly the one in Ukraine, doesn't. there's no end in sight. You are exactly right, and President Trump is correct when he says that these wars would not have started under his watch, and we can look. It was uh, during President Trump's administration. It was the only time Putin didn't invade another country. And why was that the case? Because President Trump was the strongest um, commander-in-chief we've ever had, and our adversaries feared us. We need that type of strength and resolve in the Oval Office, and they're not going to get it with Kamala Harris. It's going to be worse than Joe Biden, which is hard to imagine. It also goes back to the catastrophic withdrawal from Afghanistan, where Kamala Harris was the last person in the room advising Joe Biden of that horrific mistake. Not only Americans saw that horrific mistake, but the rest of the world did as well. And then, of course, you had Putin invading Ukraine, and we're just a year past the horrific Hamas terrorist attacks against our most precious ally, Israel, and yet you have Kamala Harris turning her back on Israel. So these foreign policy and national security crises are real. Voters are paying attention, and if you want to make the world safe, if you want to make the United States states of america more safe vote donald trump well representative elise stefanik i know you've got other interviews do i appreciate you being with us i want to give you the final word we talked to mike watley yesterday about trump force 47 as you're speaking to a lot of people around the country and, and a lot of people in the state of wisconsin obviously get out and vote but what else do you want to see people do in these next 18 days so that we can take back our republic well, sign up for Trump Force 47, just like the RNC chair Michael Watley said. That is a way to help organize your neighborhood and make sure that we get those voters out to vote. Uh, it will be, you know, in communities that you know that you're a part of, but it is the biggest grassroots organization ever. I've spoken to many of these various chapters and offices across the country, and Wisconsin is obviously the top swing state that's among a few that we are focused on so that's a way to get involved in this final two-week push because every vote is going to matter excellent representative elise stefanik i appreciate you joining us for the first time i hope it won't be the last time here on the regular joe show while you're in the state of wisconsin you've probably already been told this but make sure you get some good deep fried cheese curds you won't regret it thank you joe absolutely we'll be back in just a moment